Standing in the clouds, I started to realize the blank slate of life around me. This was beyond what most Brazilians thought was even normal. Many of them said we were quite possibly insane, driving Rio de Janeiro to Belém, Brazil in the north. That's nearly 2,800 miles, longer than driving Los Angeles to New York City. What are we getting into? Who knows? Let's go. Run, run. No one rents cars from the south and drives them all the way to the north. One of our biggest hassles in the beginning was trying to find a rental car. But we were going to do it, and off we set. Me in the driver's seat and my friends surrounded me. We drove through the night until we couldn't even see where we were going. Dark dirt roads led us where GPS knew nothing of where we were. We're just going to see where this takes us. Eventually we found our way to Itayunas. It's a city buried in sand dunes. Decades ago a dry spell came through, created mass amounts of sand that blew with strong winds until the entire city was nearly buried. Solidarity and isolation would end up becoming driving forces to this road trip. All three of us, my friend Jonah from college and my friend Clarice from working at Dom, were looking for something different, yet one in the same. We knew we'd created a life of our own manifestation, but we needed more. On the way back up through the dunes, we stopped at a little restaurant that we found on the other side. We grabbed a typical prato feito. Pratofetos are the daily meal that we taught you how to make in episode 3 of Sao Paulo. But as we headed back to our hostel in the rain, the storm came in and began to pound the local area. We chilled out, grabbed the guitar, and just relaxed as we realized we were on this road trip. Beaches. Miles of untouched beaches. Tide pools and abandoned beach bars with their boats strewn about. Completely unoccupied, full of beautiful, beautiful scenery. We kept moving. More dirt roads. Longer and farther off the GPS. Then beautiful blue skies and empty sand as far as I could see. In our little Renault, we bumped along through amazing pastel colors and palm trees. Each night, we'd reach new small beach villages that we couldn't pronounce the names of. We were completely lost and yet still having fun. As we wandered these small towns, often we were the only travelers that could be found. The miles mounted up as we kept moving north. Eventually, we could tell we were getting to somewhere extremely special and unique in the world. Beauty that none of us had ever experienced before. We were two-thirds of the way from Rio de Janeiro to Salvador when we reached Porto Seguro. Around here, we began to find tourists again, but we also found ourselves wanting to slip away from them. To most travelers, where we already were would be beautiful. Everyone was happy and playing on the beach, parasailing and enjoying the waves. But the next morning we woke up and hit, you guessed it, more dirt roads. Our little Renault Clio banged along the little dirt roads until eventually it ran dead. There we had to take a water taxi across a river to a town that had no cars. They had some donkeys, and they also had the perfect beach. Everything was a bright blue skies and turquoise waters matched with the golden sand all around us. As we explored and lounged and roamed these pristine beaches, we had them nearly all to ourselves. The journey to find the perfect beach felt as though it could be endless, and yet we felt some sort of completion in this. As we headed back in the Renault, with the sunset glaring through the dust on our windows, this day would go down as one of our favorite days.
But onwards we went, through more roads, now finding more with asphalt, but stopping for roadside meals until our journey led us to Itacare. Here in Itacare, the culture of surfers and real Brazilians was alive and well. There was lots to do and we were in a groove by this point. Swimming and hiking each day, we shared long talks on the beach about life. Eventually, I wandered off from Jonah and Clarice to enjoy the city alone, capturing its sunset and marina as young boys played soccer by the water. I honestly didn't want to leave. The next day, we planned to reach Salvador. Time was flying by and yet felt like it was still all in one moment. This massive city by the sea was at one point the first capital of Brazil. Vibrant color and culture rolls through this Bahian city in the state of Bahia, Brazil. It retains a great amount of African influences, much in part due to the slave trade that ran through this country and directly through this city at one point. The markets are clean and pristine while the waves are massive with rough tides beating the shores. As I'd said, moqueca is the most popular of one of the dishes that come from here. Moqueca comes in many various forms of seafood, rich with flavor and the use of palm oil. The flavor is as delicious as the bright color that we experienced. It was incredible to feel the power of Salvador and what it is to this country. But we are heading in towards the Amazon. Our first stop would be in Chapada de Montina, a national park reserve that was unlike any other geological region I've ever seen in my life. Chapada de Montina literally translates to steep cliffs of diamonds. As we scaled down rocky trails over the edges of cliffs, we began just bouldering down into this ravine. At the bottom, we found a waterfall that sliced through this vertical tunnel. Cachoeira, California. Welcome to California Falls. A pristine waterfall full of force, yet perfect for swimming inside. Truly, this was one of the most beautiful, small hidden spots I'd found in nature. Pretty fucking incredible. Middle of nowhere. Late at night, we'd come back and find random meals of small restaurants, seeing what the cuisine had to offer. I was still searching for that acai, but knew that I wouldn't really truly find it until I got to Belém. There was points where we could pull over and stop to have a nice acai bowl. The rich, cool flavors of the acai bowls were perfect after a long, hot day of hiking. I began to wonder, is this how they're going to taste when I get to Belém? On one of our final days in Chapada de Montina, Joan and I decided to take a hike by ourselves. Clarice wanted a day to herself, so off Joan and I set to find one of the tallest waterfalls in all of South America. With the beauty around us, Joan and I buzzed through the local villages, trying to find our way to the trailhead of this waterfall. We began talking about where we were and what we wanted. Joan admitted that he was ready to go back to Salvador to Bahia and see some old friends. He didn't feel like continuing on, and I wasn't sure if it was what was best for Clarice and I as well. We continued hiking through, and when we got to the edge of this waterfall, it was magnificent, sitting nearly a thousand feet above all other elements of life. We knew that our road trip had hit a dead end. It was time for us to go separate ways. The road trip hadn't made it as far as we had hoped, but the journey itself had been far deeper and richer than we ever expected. Later that night, I talked to Clarice. We decided to find a cheap flight from Salvador up to Belém. As she and I explored Belém, I got faint memories of my times in New Orleans. It reminded me of there for some reason. I couldn't quite tell why. Maybe it was the rich culture. Maybe it was the muggy environment. I enjoyed Belém. I was finding new fascination that I'd never expected. Everywhere I looked, there was acai popping up. All of the acai harvested in the Amazon floats down the river eventually to the ending point of Belém, where it reaches a grand market in the wee hours of the morning and is distributed throughout the country. People show up with baskets looking to sell it by the tons. 
We wanted to go find this market, but before we did, we continued to be tourists around Belém. Clarice and I visited a local fort that had been there for hundreds of years, protecting the port city of Belém. And then later we found the zoo, which cost us less than a dollar to enter. And there I found beautiful animals that I'd never seen in life before. In the middle of our time at the zoo, a massive rainstorm stopped us. Out of nowhere, the entire zoo flooded on us. And I began wondering, at what point do the crocodiles float out and come after us? After drying off and saying goodbye to the leopard, Clarice and I went home and got changed for our final meal together. She would be leaving the next evening after we visited the acai market in the morning. Together we went to the best restaurant that we knew of in Belém. We shared a delicious meal together in this funky restaurant with sausages that we poured honey over and moquecas that came out in personal dishes. A favorite dish of ours was the dessert that came out in a small little pot filled with coconut soil. You spooned it into your mouth with a small little shovel. The next morning we visited the acai market. This vibrant, rich environment was absolutely insane to be part of in the early hours of 3, 4 a.m. By the time the sun came up, most of the market dies down. I had to go to a specialty store to learn how the acai process was in order to get my acai puree. I couldn't just buy it straight from the market where the small little coconuts, not berries, were still in their raw form. Acai itself is quite perishable. In talking with my Brazilian friends I'd made in the north, in Belém, they all told me, you don't cook with acai. Fuck it, I'll come up with recipes of my own. There's no reason that we can't use this wonderful product in cooking. So I began experimenting. Thinking about rolling, a southbound I find. A common snack that I found across Brazil, often on beaches and on the sides of streets, is a hard cheese that's grilled gooey in the center and crispy on the outside. I thought to myself, what if I made a chutney with this? So I found some apples and some prunes and took the acai, worked it into a nice, thick, gooey consistency. But I was then able to take the hard cheese, similar to halloumi, a common Middle Eastern cheese. I pan seared it and got it nice and crispy where we were able to then use it to dip into the chutney. My next recipe was taking a non-cooked approach and using the common tradition of gazpacho, a cold soup that uses mostly vegetables and often fruits as well. Acai oxidizes quickly, so I also thought to myself, why not use avocado to give it a nice, rich, creamy thickness? Gazpachos are easy. You take all the flavors, balance them properly, and blend them up, and let them chill overnight to settle. The next day, often these flavors will come together in very rich, well-rounded soups. I took an onion soubise, which is just a roasted onion, pureed with some olive oil. With both the sweetness of the fruits and the richness of the onion, I topped the gazpacho with this to balance the flavor out. Pushing the limits of what acai was capable of being cooked into, my last attempt was braising a fish. I sauteed onions and garlic and added in peppers. I took a nice Amazonian white fish, similar to cod or halibut. As we stewed it all together, I was proud of myself for trying to push the limits of what acai was capable with. But I knew that my last recipe, most important to all of you, was the traditional acai bowl. Acai bowls are extremely easy to make. It's a process of just blending together the ingredients. And, now I'm down south smoking. and then topping it with your favorite garnishes, whether it be granola or fresh sliced fruit. It's just a cool snack that people eat on hot Brazilian days.
I was excited for what came next. I was getting on a plane and flying to meet Alyssa in Peru. But first I wanted to just take a moment in and embrace the power of what was Brazil. The wild, turbulent culture, the vibrant people, the beautiful, pristine beaches, and the endless, vast amounts of land that I'd crossed, exploring the deep, small nooks and crannies of what made up this massive country that took up the majority of South America.